Hi, welcome back to Artisan Exchange here at the Aga Khan Museum. I'm Shoheb Gwadri, Senior Retail Operations Manager and Product Design Specialist. I'm here in one of my favorite rooms at the Aga Khan Museum, Divan Restaurant. Created at the turn of the 19th century, the elaborately decorated panels of this Damascus room once adorned the walls and the ceiling of a private residence in the old city of Damascus. The panel's glistening surfaces evoke sumptuous textiles such as silk embroideries, carpets, or brocades. In a traditional Damascene courtyard house, such a room would have served as an important function. It was the meeting place where family would gather and receive guests. Comparable rooms survive in the grandest residence of the era. The Levantine area has historically produced master craftspeople creating unique objects of art that celebrate the diversity and cultures of this region. From rich tapestries and textiles to wood, glass, and inlay objects that fuse geometric pattern and design alongside flora, fauna, elements of design. Join me as I speak with Nimi Nanji Samard, creator and designer of Nimi Nimi Scarves that tell unique stories always centered around trials and tribulations with hopes and dreams attached. Hear how what you wear, how you wear it, or how you gift meaningfully conveys your story or messages of support to causes that are near and dear to your heart and more importantly, how you wish the world to see or hear who you are. Hi, Nimi. You know, for as long as I have known you, I have known you as uh, a designer, a woman of such grace, elegance, and power. And really, your scarves at the museum shop have done so phenomenally well. And I think it's in large part, not only due to the fact that they're designed so beautifully, but because there's such great stories attached to it. Tell us a little bit about your design inspiration or maybe if we rewind back, what got you started in the design field and working and creating these beautiful pieces? Thank you, Shohab. When I started designing the scarves, it became very clear to me early on they needed to be more than beautiful. Hmm. I'm at a certain age now where aesthetics is not enough. And I've attracted a community of people who want to be associated with a cause. Right. That aesthetic is beautiful, it's nice to own, but if it comes with a story, if it comes with a purpose, then it has more meaning, it has more longevity. Right. The imagery on my designs are what I call a visual vocabulary. Ah, that's a great way to put it. And because every scarf I design speaks to a global, a universal issue that is not going away anytime soon, such as mental health, environment, global displacement, uh, women, all these issues unless we're going to attack them, honor them, work with them now, in 50 years, we'll be in the same place. So tell me, what in the age that we're living in today, and so much has happened, I mean, we're living through a pandemic in which we've never seen in 100 years. What are some of the stories or emotions that you're wanting to convey? What is, what is one particular story that is speaking loudly to you right now in which we may find in one of your designs? You know, we're all at a time now where there is a sense of collective reckoning. Right. We are all facing ourselves by ourselves. The clutter and the noise of uh, social life, of uh, getting dolled up and impressing people is really over and we are forced to look at ourselves. And my feeling now is we're all looking deeper into what our purpose is, why we're here, mm. what is important to us. Clearly, it's the material in itself is no, not answering the, that question. 
but you, you, you're looking for purpose. Mm. And very often, purpose lies in what society needs of you. Right. Earlier this year, my, I designed a scarf called Do You See Me Now? For a few months, I had been aching to do something about Canada's missing and murdered Indigenous women. So I started researching the topic, hoping to create a design that would be a homage to these women that went missing. The more I researched, the more I saw that it was not a phenomenon exclusive to Canada. It happens everywhere in the world mm -hmm. where there is violence against women. Women disappear. Women are uh, physically assaulted and in, assaulted in many other ways. And my title, Do You See Me Now, refers to the fact that when they were alive, because they were marginalized, because they had a lifestyle that we looked down upon, we didn't look at them. Mm -hmm. But once they were murdered and their bodies found, then we looked at their faces. Hence the question, do you see me now? Isn't it so sad that, uh, you know, I don't think that this is just, you know, localized to uh, the indigenous women here in Canada, but I think to many social groups throughout the world in that many of them are living on the fringes of life and who yes. do not have a voice, do not have uh, an outlet in which to have their identity presented. Uh, you know, I think you touch upon uh, where we are at in life right now and what we want to be surrounded by. And I, I look at my own life and I look at the way I live and during COVID, we're spending more time in our homes than anywhere else. And we're looking at things surrounding us and asking ourselves, what does that mean to me? Mm -hmm. How does that object, that vase, that painting or that pillow represent me? And I think far too often, you know, we got caught up in mass consumerism. Yes. This sort of keeping up with the Joneses and having to, you know, keep our, our our own personal space is up to someone else's standard yes. rather than a reflection of who we are. And I, I, I find a great connection and so do the customers at the Aga Khan Museum shop with your scarves because they tell such poignant and pivotal stories that are relevant today. One of the scarves that I personally love um, is the one uh, that I feel is so apropos to the room that we're sitting in right now. It, sure. this, this beautiful uh, restaurant divan featuring these beautiful Damascus panels, you know, tell a beautiful story. But you also have a story that relates to Syria. Yes. And a quite tragic one. Tell us a little yes. bit about that yes. scarf. What's the title of that scarf? Ouvre-moi ta porte. Won't you open your doors for me? Beautiful. And it was a design that was inspired by the, the little boy, Alan, who, were, who had drifted ashore and was found, sadly found dead on the beach in right. Greece. Right. Those images I will never, they will never escape my mind. Very haunting. So what I did then was I designed a, 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 a scarf that has a whole variety of doors on, in them. Mm -hmm. uh, some doors I left open, some I left closed, but there are more closed than are open because politically countries and economically, countries struggle with how many people they can allow. Sure. But in the end, those people are our people. And if we don't take them, then who will? So my plea in that scarf is we have to open doors. Right. For people who are being persecuted for different reasons. And uh, we, like in Canada, we're only here, you know, by the grace of God. Right. That we are here and that we live in a beautiful country. And um, sometimes we forget. Right. That others need salvation. Agreed. And I find that 
when people write to me about my designs, it's very clear, especially in the last six months, that it's very much about what I call appartenance, a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, to have provenance, as a, in, in the art world you would say, but there's also appartenance. So when I, when I speak to the scarf uh, about the missing and endangered women or about the refugees, people belong in issues. It's, it's a bit beyond relating to an issue, is that we are all part of it. We belong in that issue. It's happened to us right. that we were refugees, we are immigrants, we've witnessed persecution. So nothing I design is really foreign to any of us if we sit back and think about life around us. You know, we had two Syrian exhibitions during the height of you know, the trauma that Syria was going through um, and is still going through, unfortunately, today. But we had two beautiful Syrian exhibitions and the visitation, the turnout was incredible. People were hungry to learn, to see, to hear about the rich history, the trials, the tribulations, and to really dispel many misconceptions that they might have had about Syria and the region yes. itself. And that ties in quite harmoniously with the items reflected in the shop. Yes. Because through the marriage of what we present in the galleries with what allows people to take home a piece of their museum experience, mm -hmm. they're able to take home an experience, a meaningful experience, a meaningful experience as it ties mm -hmm. into what they have just witnessed. Yes, and I think it also helps each one of us become a bit of a change agent. Uh, and that's empowering. I love that, I we're, love we're that. Our change. If you're going to wear a scarf that talks about mental health on your shoulders, because I'm using your shoulders to, con to convey an issue. You know, I think you make a good point in that I think many of us think that to be change agents that we must be the likes of Malala or Greta Thunberg yes. or any one of these very vivacious, very phenomenal people who are out there doing big and ginormous things. But many of us maybe don't have the wherewithal ability to do those grandiose things, but oh. we can in our own way in our own everyday way, yes. beach change makers. Awareness in itself is the first step. Agreed. To being a change maker. So if you're taking a piece from the museum shop, you know the history of it, you know it represents something, and then you will speak to it. I agree, and I think this, in this day and age, in mass consumerism where it seems that people have everything and when there's an opportunity to gift. Yes. People are quite concerned, well, what do you give to that person that has everything already? And I think that's where the shop, that's where your beautiful scarves have an opportunity to display and convey a strong sense of individuality and a message yes. with purpose. A message with purpose, and I find, in my, particularly in my corporate clients, that they uh, commission designs or uh, buy from my collection scarves that reflect, the, the stories that reflect the corporate values. Right. So that's on the corporate side. On the individual side, Yes, you're, always, you're often dealing with people who have everything. So the one way to give something to somebody who has everything is to give them something that has a lot of meaning. Right. Something that will move them, that will touch them, and that they will carry with pride. And it doesn't have to be, it, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be extravagant in terms of price tag. It could be as simple as, you know, a small little bowl that has been hand painted yes. by indigenous artists of a certain region in a certain part of the world that perhaps would never have the opportunity to have their work showcased abroad. But yes. we are doing our own little part in feeding people, nourishing people, 
meaningful experiences. Just love that. Yes. Yeah. It's, it gives people, it, it, you know, when one walks into your gift shop, the person who has everything might feel some kind of guilt that here I am shopping again. But as you go through what's in there, it's, the, the guilt disappears mm. because, because of the story. Right. Because it's supporting somebody somehow, somewhere. Right. Or that it's raising awareness somehow, somewhere. Right. So when you, when you, when you are in your, when the, we come into your shop and you pick something up, it's not, not just a thing. It's not right. just a pretty thing. It has a story. Yeah, I, 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 I like to think that we are in support of humanity, arts in humanity, and ensuring that this type of craft that you find in the shop, this type of design, continues on for generations to come. Yes. And then it doesn't become, you know, a point to where suddenly you're seeing, you know, an abolition of design because there is there is no longer a market of appreciation for it. No. And I, but I think that people who come into the museum shop, I would say we are humbled. And that's mm. a necessary experience. It's a necessary experience, a necessary emotion mm -hmm. for the longevity of art. So tell me, you have how many different designs in this collection right here? of scarves? Sixteen to eighteen different designs. Right. My designs are divided by pillars. Ah, tell us about that. So the businesses, uh, the designs are divided by pill in pillars. You have uh, mental health, you have the environment, you have global displacement, and you have community. Wow. So every, everything I design goes into one of those four pillars. And these are the four pillars that are universal mm -hmm. and uh, lifelong. Brilliant. And we are affected by each one of it every single day. And so it must be as if I'm asking you to pick a favorite child. <laughs> <clears throat> so I won't say pick your favorite, but if you had to gift one, and I know you might say to yourself, well, it all depends on the person, yes. but which is your favorite to gift and why? The doors. The doors, yeah. Apart from the exhibition over here about the doors, outside of the little boy's story, it is interesting to me how many people just love doors. It, it is incredible, yeah. And the color scheme is such that it's very versatile. Right. So. We had an exhibition here um, by famed artist who unfortunately is no longer with us, Abbas Kerostami. Mm -hmm you know, about beautiful doors from yes. all over the world. And it was, it was just so magical to be able to walk in that exhibition and see all those doors. And one could visit Zanzibar and, yes. you know, see the various types of doors. They're quite magical. Absolutely. Now, the environment plays, the environment is at top of mind right now. We see this around the world. Mm -hmm. um, we see countries that are being disproportionately affected um, around the world as well, particularly in the east, in arid, dry, desert climates, we see, um, you know, literally countries that are on the verge of disappearing underwater. Yes. Now tell I mean, us about what you've done with your scarves dedicated around the environment. In my designs, what I've tried to elucidate is that every element in my design requires clean air and clean water. Mm. There's not much to say there. I think those are very virtuous points. I think that they speak volumes. Now tell me you also do work in, in the sense that there are oftentimes proceeds of the sale of your scarves that go towards certain causes as well. One of the first things I did when I launched my business 
was to commit to giving 30% back to charity off the customer's choice. Wow. And, and this applies to all the online sales. Right. So that a person can buy a scarf, there's a drop-down window, and they can give us the name of the charity that they want the money to go to. Right. That's brilliant. 30% of our gross sales. That's excellent. And the customer picks. That's brilliant. That's a very, very noble cause. Nimi, thank you so much for being here today. It was so exciting to hear about all these beautiful stories that you have dedicated to each of these scarves. I think now more than ever, we are wanting to give meaningfully and in support of a cause. And there's no better way to do that than wearing it on your shoulders and projecting to the world what you present. So thank you so much. Such an honor to be here, and that was so well captured. Thank you for it. Thank you for the invitation. You're welcome. Yeah.